Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, I'm Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on remote learning and engagement, best practices and opportunities for Israel engagement. This is, a, this is the second in a three-part series on remote learning and engagement. The next session will address Jewish educational experience. That's February 17th, between 1 and 2 p.m. Eastern time. Today, we're really excited to dive into Israel engagement. So since March 2020, there has been a very few educational interventions and initiatives that have not had to pivot to the virtual delivery of services and programs. While some institutions have expanded already existing capacities, others have had to radically reimagine their educational practices and business models. And in some cases, this has uncovered ways of reaching never previously imagined audiences. In this session on Israel experiences, we will focus on the pivot taken by Onward Israel this past summer offering more than 500 remote internship experiences in Israel. Today, we are fortunate to hear from Josh Donner, Executive Director of the Shapira Foundation, Alan Wagner, President and CEO of Onward Israel, and Neti Aron, Senior Project Associate at Rasav Consulting. Um, and now I wanna turn it over to Josh to get us started today. Thank you so much, Josh. Thanks, Tamar. Uh, happy to start. Um, I'll provide some uh, kind of overview as a funder of how we look at the funding, and then I look forward to uh, seeing the actual uh, data and information from uh, from Nettie. Um, so, you know, big picture uh, as a funder, the way uh, we the, um, evaluation is really important. Um, we really invest for outcomes. Uh, you know, the number of trips is an important measure of scale. Um, uh, satisfaction is very important to understand the value of the product um, so that uh, to attract future participants, but those are proxy measures. Ultimately, the, the purpose of the program is to have transformative experiences. And um, we want to know that those, uh, that the experiences that participants are having are, are in fact transformative. Um, so Onward has a great, uh, um, system of with pre and post surveys, looking at affect knowledge behavior around three factors, personal, professional growth, uh, Jewish identity and connection to Israel um, for all participants. Uh, and then also longitudinally looking to see if those uh, those measures stick over time. Um, and uh, we uh, as a funder are really focused on those high level, um, the high level of uh, um, those three factors, personal, professional and growth, connection to Israel and, and Jewish identity, um, and to make sure that they are, um, uh, for each participant, that they are uh, changing. Um, so specific to the pandemic, it's a really interesting uh, question. Um, the, the concept that is being that we're talking about are the remote internships. And um, so the idea that if a uh, the participant can't get on the airplane to go to Israel, but they can do a remote internship. Does that, um, you know, to what extent does that have impact? And initially we were thinking of, um, of these remote internships as really just a replacement uh, during the pandemic, if they can't get on the airplane, is this good enough? And in that context, we didn't even, we weren't even sure it was worth studying or even doing, um, because how could it possibly relate, you know, how could it possibly compare to the in-person? But then we reframed our thinking, um, and Alon deserves enormous credit for uh, um, for helping us think this way, um, that the idea of the remote internship is really an opportunity to enhance the business model, um, that uh, now participants could extend their internship for a longer period of time, um, could uh, offer new products to new populations. So for example, having a shorter in-person over experience over winter break and uh, and extending the, the internship uh, in a remote way uh, when they return home. So it really reframed our thinking from not, is it even worth doing remote internships to, is there enough value of the remote internship uh, when packaged with the in-person to make the whole experience uh, worthwhile? Um, so that's the lens through which uh, we were looking, we are looking at the information which uh, I'll now hand off to Nettie to actually share what we learned. Excellent, thank you, Josh. Um, so I will be sharing um, the findings from our research uh, from this past summer. Our, our, our focus really on this past summer differed from all the other previous summers. We've been working with Onward um, since, since it started in uh, 2012. And um, our research from year to year 
as, as Josh mentioned, is, is really focused on outcomes in um, these three key ways in the personal professional um, in, with, in, with regards to Israel and with regards to Jewish identity. Um, so this past summer, uh, we had to shift our research question a little bit, um, really trying to get a sense of what happens on a remote program in terms of these outcomes and how does it compare to previous in-person programs? Um, so the way we explored this question is by, um, we, we, first of all, we modified the instruments, uh, the, the surveys that we've used before, um, because that was a, a critical piece of um, addressing the changes to this past summer. Um, and then we, um, as we usually do, we administer a, a pre-program survey um, about two weeks before the program and a post-program survey about two weeks after. Um, and we sent this survey to 496 participants um, in, in the remote program. And we got a, a pretty similar response rate to what we've seen actually in in-person summers, a little over 50%. Um, we had 256 participants who responded to both surveys and, and um, we used their data to um, really understand the um, impact of the program. So um, one, one of the ways we look at the impact um, uh, is by asking this key question in the post-program survey, um, where we try to understand what participants gained from their time on the program. And what we see here is we have a look back. Um, we have the 2020 data um, from this past summer, and then we compare it to two previous um, summers. And um, the data here is arranged in a heat map where the highest percentages are in red, and then they um, uh, decrease to the green ones. The, the ones in uh, the lowest ones are in green, um, and the yellow ones are in the middle. Um, and so it really gives a, a good visual picture of how this summer really did compare um, in, in certain ways. And um, what we're seeing here is that the remote program, unsurprisingly, um, it, it did not have as strong of an impact as it had um, when the program was in person. Um, importantly, though, it's not that it didn't have any impact at all. Um, what, we, what we see here is that it has some impact, um, but, but less. Um, and uh, what, what's, what's also very um, notable here is that the, the top item here about um, participants' um, ability to, to gain a valuable work experience um, was, was fairly comparable to, to the in-person internship. Um, so that was clearly an area of, of value and success. Um, and then, you know, there were some other areas like, for example, um, learning more about Israel um, or exploring their Jewish identity or the last item of building meaningful relationships with others where clearly there, there was um, a decrease compared to what, um, what we've seen in previous summers. But it, it ranges kind of between, you know, 25 to 40%, which again, like, Given that the program um, was was not designed in the same way, it you know it didn't have the the, the magical pieces that it usually does in an in-person program um, to to affect those dimensions of impact. It still was able to do something um, to an extent in those ways. Um, so uh, that that really was kind of a, a key finding that there's some impact, but less than an in-person program. Um, Another way we, we tend to look at impact um, is really through, through comparing the pre-data and the post-data. Um, and so uh, there's, there, as we mentioned, there's these you know, three key dimensions. Um, the first one we're going to explore is, is uh, participants' connection to Jewish identity. Um, and so the way we, we look at the data is um, the pre-program survey and the post-program survey are designed in very similar ways. They, they have similar items that we're then able to compare um, how participants' responses change over time. So in terms of connection to Jewish identity, um, I'm showing you here what, um, what some of the, uh, what the four survey items are that are used to measure this kind of a larger outcome. Um, and uh, just so you understand the um, participants rate these items on a scale. Um, uh, from, let's say, um, from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, and they do that before the program and after the program. And what we, what we did here was we um, created a composite variable by, by averaging um, the, the scores for all four of these um, items. And 
here we see um, the change over time. Again, we're, we're looking at um, the 2020 summer, um, this past summer, and we're comparing it to the two previous summers. And what we're seeing here is the percentage of participants whose score um, in their connection to Jewish identity decreased, um, the percentage that their scores stayed the same, and the percentage that increased. And if you take a look at this, um, what's, what's interesting here is that it's pretty similar what happened this past summer to previous summers, um, where we see kind of a, a, about a third, a little over a third increased, um, a little under a third uh, stayed the same, and a, also a little over a third decreased, and it's, it's quite similar. Um, just a note to say that this particular outcome, connection to Jewish identity, is even in, in, in when, when we do the in-person program um, evaluation and research, we see that this is an area where there isn't um, a considerable amount of change. And it's largely due to the fact that participants come into the program already being pretty connected. Um, for, for most participants, this is their uh, second time in Israel or, or more than that, um, but they've been there before and they've, um, they, they already are coming in with um, some prior Jewish educational experiences. And so um, the, the, the bar is a little higher in terms of like being able to move the dial. Um, so what we saw this past summer definitely is similar to what we've seen in past years. Um, and it's an area where um, we weren't sure if we would, ex we would even see that much change. Another area that we um, explore is participants' relationship to Israel. Now, obviously, um, this, is, this is an area that um, if, if they're not able to be in Israel, it's clearly going to be affected. So we, we already had that, you know, part of our hypothesis coming in was that um, this, this was likely going to be different than what we've seen in in-person experiences. Here again, we're, I'm, I'm uh, showing you when we say relationship to Israel, what do we mean? Um, so these are the items that we, uh, that we use to, to talk about um, participants' relationship to Israel. Um, the, the fact that they feel a strong connection to Israel and Israelis, um, that they're willing to educate others about Israel, that it's an important part of their Jewish identity. These, are, these, these all make up um, what it means to have a, a strong relationship to Israel. Um, and again, we looked at the, the average scores um, to, to create the composite. And, um, and, and the data that, that, um, that came out of um, our research um, pretty much supports our hypothesis that, there, that this, this past summer is definitely a bit different um, than what we've seen from the in-person programs. Specifically, um, what we've seen here is that uh, um, the, the proportion of participants from the remote programs whose uh, scores on this, on this outcome of their relationship to Israel, there were uh, there's a little bit over a third, um, a little under 40% um, who, whose scores increased, um, about a quarter who stayed the same, and then a little over a third who's decreased. And this, this kind of differs from the past um, previous summers where we have, you know, a little under a half whose scores increase in this area. Um, and uh, that, again, as expected, it, it, it's, it's not... Um, you know, too surprising, um, but it, the data definitely helps kind of uh, flesh that out and, and understand it better. Uh, lastly, the, the third bucket of outcomes is um, uh, participants' professional development, um, which is very much related to their internship experience, of course. And um, here we, again, have um, these uh, individual survey items that, um, that make up uh, our our focus on professional development. Um, and, uh, and I want you to pay special attention to, to these because um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna piece these apart a little bit in just a few minutes. Um, we're gonna get a closer look at what the data look like for some of these specific items. Um, and part of why we're gonna do that is because of the findings that, that we see here, which are pretty peculiar. Um, from this past summer, uh, the, the remote program participants, there's kind of something interesting going on here where um, there's, there's an equal proportion of folks who, who, um, who say that their, their professional development has, has uh, grown 
um, and increased. And then that's you know 40%. And then there's another 40% whose whose scores on these items decreased. Um, and about 20, you know, 20% who stayed the same. Um, here again, like what like with um, the uh, what we just saw in terms of participants' relationship to Israel, we're seeing weaker impact um, in terms of their professional development compared to what we've seen in the in-person experience. Um, and that was surprising to us because, you know, uh, um, the, the whole theory here is that an internship is an internship irrespective of, you know, what part of the globe you're on. Um, and that's why we're going to unpack some of these items um, to help clarify that. Um, just to emphasize, uh, you know, there's um, a little over half of participants in the in-person programs that, um, based on their data, uh, they they really showed growth in their professional development. Um, and so, when we look at uh, um, two of these items, it helps explain a little bit more of what's going on here. One of the items uh, in the survey is um, feeling comfortable in a cross-cultural work environment. Um, and the other is knowing where one is headed professionally or what their options are. So we're going to take a closer look here. First, we're going to look at the um, participants' comfort in a cross-cultural work environment. And this really, really shows us um, uh, a bit more of what's going on for participants, um, where in the remote program, um, there's there's only about a fifth who who say that they feel more comfortable in a cross-cultural work environment. Um, and over half, their, their scores haven't changed, you know, from before the program to after the program, it's pretty similar. Um, and then we have actually about a quarter um, whose scores decreased on this item. Um, and this differs considerably from, uh, from the in-person programs in 2019 and 2018, where uh, there's over a third, um, close to 40% even, who's, who, who do considerably feel more comfortable in a cross-cultural work environment. Um, now, the way this obviously affects um, the previous slide uh, that looks at professional development overall, and, um, and, and you know, it, it makes good sense given where people are literally sitting um, or where they were sitting this past summer. Um, the uh, working at a you know intern like a, a an organization that's based in Israel from your home in the U.S. or in Canada um, is is obviously not the same cross cultural experience as actually being in Israel itself um, in that organization. Um, and so obviously you know there's there's going to be some just a different kind of experience there. Um, and then looking at the other item that very much affected um, the professional development scores, knowing where one is headed professionally or what their options are. So here too, we see that um, this is an item where in 2019 and in 2018, there, was, there were over a third of participants <clears throat> who, who really felt like they left the program, knowing more about what their options were professionally or where they were headed professionally. Whereas in the remote program, about a quarter felt that way, which was definitely a decrease. Um, and what we'd like to propose is that it may not necessarily be about the program itself. It may actually be more about just the state of the world and the uncertainty um, that people found themselves in this past summer um, and thinking about their professional futures and not really knowing what was gonna be. And so we think that, that that likely plays a bigger role than the, than the remote internship experience itself in affecting how people feel about this particular, this particular item. All right. Um, I realized I went through that pretty quickly. So I definitely just want to say if anyone has any questions about this, you're definitely welcome to uh, share it in the Q&A. Um, uh, but I, I, I want to sum up here with some questions for consideration based on the data. Um, so one thing that I know um, Ilan is going to talk about a bit more uh, is um, where Onward is moving to next and how they're thinking about their program development. Um, and so one of the things on Onward's mind is developing uh, and rolling out uh, hybrid programs that include both a 
in-person component and a remote component. And so a really good question is, how can the remote portion of these hybrid programs get at these other areas that Onward is trying to address um, beyond the internship? So these areas of exploring uh, Jewish identity and, and strengthening participants' connection to Israel and cultivating meaningful social relationships. How can um, the remote portion try to do that better? And, and actually, should it? Um, or should that be left to an in-person uh, component? So that's a very important question to consider. Um, and then the other important question that, that we posit here is, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about the future of the working world and how remote work is becoming much more prevalent, uh, much more common, and it feels like the future. Um, and so there's really an opportunity here um, to, to harness of how to, um, create an, an internship experience that really taps into the cross-cultural aspect um, that, that um, working at an international Israeli um, uh, organization can, can offer. Um, and so that is something that, um, again, that was one of the items that participants scored lower on. And so the question is what, you know, is there something that uh, can be done to, to try to get at that more in, in the remote internship experience. Um, all right, so I'm going to pass it on uh, to Ilan, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Neti uh, and Josh and, and Tamara. Thank you for uh, inviting uh, us and, and for Onward Israel have a chance to have this dialogue. I I, uh, I don't know if I was supposed to, but I glanced at the participant list and saw a lot of old old friends and names and some new folks too. So uh, it's great to reconnect and to make the new connection um, as well. Um, before I respond or, or kind of talk about what um, Neti and Josh spoke about, I think that um, I saw a couple of questions in the Q&A and I think it may be important to point out, I mean, the people were um, uh, noting that uh, there was a decline on these identity factors in all three areas, even in normal years. Um, and obviously it's sort of a jarring, you know, data point where we're doing a program, we're bringing people to Israel and we're causing damage, what's going on? So um, the, the way that I look at that, I think, first of all, is that uh, there is a, uh, a natural uh, inclination or natural path, I think, of young people uh, for these indicators to go down over time. We're kind of in our interventions trying to check a natural tendency uh, of decline and trying to reverse it where we can. Um, and that's part of what we're seeing here, I think, is that uh, when people are you know, giving us an indicator of their identity before an experience and after, time has gone by, in which case we're also marking to what degree they're changing uh, without our intervention. So part of it is seeing this as a way of, of checking some things that would continue to decline even more so. Um, and part of it, I certainly think what Neti said is true about the high levels coming in. There wasn't much room to go forward and be interested to know more from Neti afterwards, of course, about the depth of the decline. Um, you know, the way we look at it, of course, is that if we're uh, taking 30, 40, 50 percent of the people and making a, a positive change in their Jewish identity, that's where the key uh, change is happening. And what we're focusing on. Um, and I think the other element I would mention is I think there are people for whom the experience opens up questions for them. It gives them a new perspective on things and makes them ask themselves about themselves. Uh, so we have to understand this as a data point in time. And I can certainly, you know, almost looking back on our own reflections is a point when you have a question about something you thought to be true and then you work through it and you come out even stronger on the other side. But while you're working through it, you might ask questions about what you thought before. Um, so I think part of that questioning, and I can certainly say anecdotally on the professional aspect, for example, we often have people say, you know, I wanted to do this with my life, I came on onward, and now I don't know. And we say, oh, that's great. You know, it's better that you found out when you're 20 than when you're 40 that you don't want to do this. So it's kind of a good thing to ask these questions. Um, and I think, you know, on another occasion, we can look at the longitudinal data of onward, which is, I think, over 10 months or three years kind of goes us on the on the right trajectory. But happy to engage with this more at the end. I wanted just to point it out now because it was on people's minds. Um, more specifically now regarding the topic at hand about the remote program. So uh, the first thing I want to stress is that when we talk about a remote internship program, we really, uh, it's not just a remote internship. It's a remote internship program, which also includes distance learning and educational elements. 
So the architecture of the remote program is uh, uh, working certain hours a week with the Israeli company, having check-in calls with a, a, a mentor, uh, having check-in calls with a professional who's guiding the internship process, having once a week educational sessions on Jewish and Israeli topics, uh, having a social interaction with each other, uh, virtually of course, people engage in the program. So we try to look at a number of different elements to create an experience. Um, I saw some people also asking about the cross-cultural or cross-cultural immersion pieces of this, and I'll try to address that. But that was the first clarification that it's actually a holistic experience uh, of the internship and of the educational component. Uh, and the second just general point to make is, as Neti and Josh both stress, is that we kind of look at this in two ways. Um, it is a fallback option when we can't do in-person programs, which was the case last year. Uh, I wouldn't be a, you know, a, a, a hubris enough to say that we're past that for the summer. We're hopeful, but none of us really know. So, so that's one way to look at remote. And we did have a remote program in the winter because we couldn't bring people um, from, from North America. We decided to launch a remote program instead. The other aspect of the remote program is the way it becomes part of the hybrid experience, in which case there are portions of the program being done remotely and portions being done in Israel. Um, and that for us, as Josh pointed out too, is of course a growth area, an area of new possibilities, but getting the remote part right in that context, of course, is critical. So I think the things that we've been focusing on that the data helped us kind of uh, uh, learn about uh, and think how do we do this uh, better next time and better in my view is you know maximizing the impact that remote could have. We don't think better means equaling the impact of the in-person, but maximizing the impact it could have. And so we want to believe that there's an upside still to get to in terms of the programmatic changes could have an impact. Um, so the things that we're focused on really, I think, first of all is you know, developing what the remote expertise around remote internships. Uh, this is a new field for to someone to know how to work with a remote intern, how to manage their time, how to train them, how to define the job description. Uh, you know, we've spent a decade getting this right for the in-person experience. It's not copy paste. So understanding how that changes, how many hours a week do you need? How many check-ins do you have? Uh, in what fields does it work? In what fields does it not work? Um, how do we uh, train and orient the company, the mentors themselves, they know how to do this. Uh, these are all things that we're developing expertise around learning from the experiences and of course trying to improve each time in each of those aspects. Um, the second part of, an, of improving is looking at the educational program itself, which is uh, uh, one more thing, by the way, regarding the first one, one of the things we learned is that actually the interaction of the intern with the mentor at the company is not just a professional you know, interaction, that's also cultural immersion in Israel. So getting mentors to kind of not just talk about work, but talk about life and talk about what's going on in Israel and share stories um, and have people you know, come into work meetings when people are wearing sandals and, and, and writing emails when you're addressing people with their first name and not Mr. All these things are you know, little tidbits of a cultural immersion which can actually be powerful. So we are working with the mentors to make sure that they see their role not just in a professional way, but this is also engagement. Um, on the educational piece, we learned a lot about, and everyone is learning, about distance learning, what works, what doesn't work, the best ways to do it. Um, and and our, our major challenge is to try to get the authentic Israeliness of Onward Israel communicated through distance learning, which is hard. Um, but we have some programs that we do that are very popular with people. Um, we have one program called Meet the Israelis, which in person is actually speed dating with Israelis of different types, where you kind of go and spend a few minutes talking to an Israeli Arab and a few minutes to an ultra-Orthodox Jew and a few minutes to someone with a, a right-wing perspective, someone with a left-wing perspective, and someone that comes from the city, and someone from the kibbutz, and you get kind of in a room a perspective of different views of Israeli society. This is a program we're able to do virtually as well, and actually in small breakout groups in a Zoom context, you meet six or seven Israelis in the course of an hour and talk about similar topics with them from different perspectives. So learning how to do this, uh, thinking about how do we get people out into the field, so to speak, and see Israel uh, you know, through virtual tours and through interactions, how do we get to the authentic spokespeople, keeping group sizes small, um, all those kinds of things. And then I'll, I'll finish up with sort of the larger question, which is sort of what is the balance, you know, in this hybrid model between the remote and in person? And there's all kinds of really interesting design questions here. Uh, what's the order of time one should spend in each of them? What's the length of time, you know, the, 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 um, the order?
order of the experiences? Should it be remote first, then in Israel, and Israel first, then remotely? How do you link the two experiences? Um, and these are things where we're playing with different models. Uh, truthfully, COVID is difficult um, environment to experiment in because it has its limitations. So for example, um, we're very excited in the winter about this four week in Israel program and continuing on remotely and reaching a whole new group of people who don't have two months in winter breaks, but have a month of winter break. Um, but when it turned out that we had a uh, have quarantine restrictions and we couldn't bring people into the country if it wasn't for at least six weeks we had to forego that model for this year so and we're seeing similar things in the summer where it's not um you know the difficulties of implementing a new approach um which we think has value in the world of tomorrow in terms of new models of remote internships or remote work but we see the mechanical difficulties kind of getting it going um and finally, I'd say another question which is raised for us, just as the ideological question in some ways about, you know, should we be doing an only remote program? Um, it, does it, you know, is there value to this in and of itself? And this is some of the questions that the research raises, because one could say, okay, it's not as effective as, uh, but it also costs a lot less, and you can maybe get the people who won't travel but would do this. So is there an ideological barrier to say, like Onward Israel embraces remote internships? Is it only a fallback or part of the hybrid? Uh, these are open questions for us, and we kind of are dealing with them within the context of COVID and what we're you know able to do and not able to do. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that later. So thank you for that part. Thank you all so much for that, for your informative presentations. And now I know that you all have some questions that you have for each other um, to respond to. And then I also want to encourage, I see we already have some questions in the Q&A. If people um, that are participating today have more questions, we will definitely have time for that at the end. But now I want to welcome back Josh and Nancy also to come back in dialogue with Ilan. Um, thank you, Tamar. Um, I, uh, I have a question I've been curious about for a number of years now. We talked about it a bit, but um, question for you, Josh. Um, of how you as a funder, um, how do you use the, the reports that we put together, um, that our research team puts together? Uh, I really appreciate this question. I've been on both sides and I know like you work so hard on the report and you're like, well, but how are people actually gonna hear it and, and use it? Um, uh, so I'll kind of answer that two ways. Um, you know, one is as a funder and very directly as a funder, um, we, like I think many investors, we're investing for impact, for outcomes. Um, you know, uh, the principals that I work for make the decision to write this check because they want to know that they're transforming the lives of, of the participants in the program. So at a very high level, um, you know, the, the reports that you've been generating over the years, we look at them, you know, we've, we know that there's proof of concept that this program works. We're very aware that the same product that worked five years ago might not still work. So it's really important to uh, almost like when you look at a financial audit and you're looking for that key sentence, you know, is it a clean, clean audit? Um, we want to know that the program is still working and, and uh, the, all of the fancy charts diving into the details are very important. And I'll get to that in a second, but um, you can't overstate the, you know, executive summary. Um, the program that was designed 10 years ago uh, still fundamentally works. Um, so that's kind of as a, with a funder hat. Then there's the partner hat where, um, you know, it's fascinating and we're still, like you, still absorbing some of these important findings um, that you're taking. Uh, to, um, to me, the main takeaway, and I think it really reflects positively on Alan is how Alan laid out, I think so well, so many of the business decisions, you know, the world has changed and there's so many variables that could change um, that could lead to how the program can adjust to meet the new realities of the world with remote work and, and so many things. The fact that um, uh, Alan is so focused on uh, actual outcome measures and not just satisfaction um, is I think really important. Um, so, you know, for example, we had earlier information that was shared at a board meeting that was based on initial anecdotes and satisfaction that we, and we knew that it was early preliminary information and it, some of the, the things held in your 
outcomes data, but some of it was different. And uh, it would have been easy to just say, you know, well, the participants said they had a great time that summer, so it was successful. It's so important to look at the actual outcomes on the affect knowledge behavior, uh, connection to Israel, connection to uh, to Jewish life, personal and professional growth, um, because ultimately that's what it's about. So if I sound about uh, like a broken record on that point, I think it's because it's so important. Um, so I want to turn it over to Alan and ask you, Alan, to share um, an example of one of those times, maybe from the past, uh, another time where it really did play out, where you know you had a uh, hypothesis or, or um, anecdotal evidence, but then when you look for the actual uh, uh, outcomes information, that led you to make a different business decision. Great, thank you, Josh, and I and I hope we will have similar insights beyond this new remote data as well going forward. But I will give an example from on a different issue, which actually is is fairly pertinent given the course of events, kind of you know in the world. And I, you know, I'm sure the people on the call know that we are um, involved in very exciting conversations um, right now with with Birthright about merging forces and joining together for kind of a new new stage in this uh, idea of engaging people with Israel. So that's the larger context, which is very exciting for us. Um, and that and that brings me to the example of uh, responding to Josh, which is that we originally thought of Onward Israel as a um, that its impact would be on the return to Israel for someone who had been on a short trip. Um, so the classic model was you would do birthright or you had done a, a teen travel trip and then you would come back to uh, Onward uh, two or you know three years later after your initial trip and the, the act of returning in itself was the impactful educational contribution that it was two separate trips to Israel, there was two decisions to come, and that was sort of where the, where the bang for the buck was. Um, <clears throat> what we saw in, in reality was that despite, despite our best designs, the demographic group we're working with is a bit smarter than we are, and they uh, understood that they could um, uh, do the experiences together. They could uh, come on birthright uh, and in advance sign up for Onward Israel for the same summer, um, and creating an Israel summer for themselves, obviously uh, making the program more affordable by being on birthright first um, and having the two experiences be back to back. Um, and we began to notice this as a phenomenon happening by the participants and we said, oh, that's, that's interesting and, and, and it's not what we had thought should happen and, and maybe we should oppose it or maybe we should, you know, try to put our foot down and say, no, that's not the way it's supposed to go. And then we said, well, why don't we find out, first of all, if there's any difference in impact between the two models, because maybe it doesn't matter. Who do we, who, what do we know? Um, so we asked Rossov to look at this. I think this was back in 2016, if I remember correctly, the year, and said, what's, what's compare the two different groups? Let's compare people who went on onward and went back, went on birthright, went back home and came back to those who combined it in the same summer, and let's see if there's any difference in impact. Um, and what we saw in, in general was that there wasn't a big difference in impact, that well, what was the difference in impact was having the two experiences. And that having the two experiences actually gave people stronger Jewish identities and connection to Israel than people who did not have, um, who, had, who had come in onward without birthright before it. So we learned that there was something very special about the two programs going together, but not necessarily in the model that we thought. Um, and then we said, well, in that case, there's no need to oppose what people are doing for kind of, you know, utilitarian reasons, and we should embrace the concept and be open to it. Um, and even to the point that now, bringing back to the overall discussions with Birthright, one of the exciting concepts thinking about in the future is how to create really uh, integrated programs that really do give people the opportunity and to reach many more people by combining the experiences. So. We had a position, uh, learned that it was uh, not accurate or not well-founded based on the data, made a policy change, and I think the program is stronger for it, and now we have a whole new window of opportunities. So thank you, Neti, <laughs> or whoever did that report. <laughs> well, and thank you, Alan, for reminding me about that, because you're reminding me I was on the wrong side of that initial hypothesis. I was confident that it was a mistake to have the bundled experience, and right. I, so I was thrilled to be proved yeah. wrong. Very good. Um, I want to encourage people, if you have questions, to keep on um, keep, keep on putting that in the Q&A box or the chat. Um, and so maybe we'll jump to one of those. And then then also Nettie, Josh, and Ilan, if you have continued questions for each other, please, please add. So there's one here. Um, and some of this has been touched on already. But 
But let's dive deeper into this just because it seems like it came up again. So we have one that says, thanks so much for this data and presentation. I'm very surprised to see that, it, that in normal years, roughly a third of participants go down on key metrics. How do you understand this decline, especially since it seems quite sizable? And then in addition, there's another one that says, am I reading these charts correctly? That one third of participants in most years see their connection to Judaism and Israel go down after the program. How do you account for those who feel less of a connection? And I know that it was touched on before, but I felt maybe we should, maybe there's more to, to touch on. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in about, um, about these. Uh, so, so there's really, there's two things I would, I would say about this. Um, one is, the first has to do with like the, the, the methodology, the quantitative work um, here, and, and that has to do with the, the survey design. Um, and so surveys, especially when, when we're working with, um, with skill questions, um, where you're rating something you know, on a scale of one to seven, um, they're a bit limited in that um, there's gonna be, there is gonna be variability um, in, in, in both directions. And so um, what happens is if, you know, if, if someone goes from, let's say they choose a seven in the beginning of you know, a, a strongly agree, and then a, after the program, they choose an agree, a six, um, it might not be the biggest difference, uh, like practically for them, but numerically, um, it is it is a difference, and that gets accounted for in that decrease. Um, and so this is definitely one of the limitations of survey work, um, which like and anybody who works in survey work um, deals with, um, and uh, and we've faced it year to year and and um, across the board on on our projects and something we're trying to account for. And one of the ways we do account for it, actually, this is the second thing, is um, by, by supplementing our quantitative work with qualitative work. So there's been a number of summers where we also interview participants um, over the course of the program. We'll do um, pre, before they go on the program, we'll, we'll speak to them about their motivations and what they're looking to gain. Um, and then throughout the program, we talk about their experience and also when they go home. Um, and, and it really gives some more context to what's going on for them. And I know, um, Elon, you mentioned this in terms of the professional development of how there are a lot of participants who, who will say like, I thought I wanted to do something. I thought I wanted to, you know, um, to work in a lab for, you know, to, to become a biologist. But now that I've done it, I like, don't want to do that anymore, you know? So it, it, it can recalibrate for them. And, and interestingly, also like with regards to Israel, um, what we've heard from participants in the past is that this, as I mentioned before, for, for nearly all of them, this is a, a next level Israel experience. Many of them have gone on birthright before, which, which we know, you know, that's a, a shorter trip. Um, and, um, it, and this like onward, especially the educational components really seek to give them an exposure to Israel that they haven't had before. And that's a bit more complex. You see a bit more of the nuances of Israeli society. And what we've heard from participants is some of them might come away like with their, they, they kind of go from like this uh, black and white thinking to like, well, it's, there's some gray areas. And I'm not totally sure what I think about this. I, I you know, I, um, I, I, I believe in Israel and I, and I, you know, I want to support it, but there's also some things that I want to learn more about. Um, and it's some things I want to, you know, explore more and, um, and that can uh, th that can also play into into some of the findings um, with the Jewish identity. Again, um, as we mentioned, like what we're seeing a lot there is what I mentioned at first of this. Um, we call it like a ceiling effect, where a lot of them come in very quite high. And this also speaks to the survey design, which we're hoping to to work on going forward. Of maybe some of these questions, the um, or the survey items need to be a bit. Um, like we talk a lot about um, at Rosoff, like uh, soft outcomes and hard outcomes, and and like maybe the bar um, of of what, like the dial that we're trying to move, maybe needs to be a bit sharper, um, and uh, and so it's it has to do with the questions we're asking um, to to try to get at more of like the the, the um, practical change for for folks. Um, so that is something we're we're thinking about as well. But that's what we see a lot there. It's it's. It, it's a lot of people going from like a seven to a six, um, and it's not intentional. It's 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 not you know so so that is something we um, we do kind of have to work with as we go along. Josh or Ilan, any other thoughts on on those questions? I think it's been answered thoroughly. I just yeah. maybe to re restate 
reinforce in case some people watching don't know that you know the theory of change for onward is that providing an unmediated experience will deepen the participants relationship with Israel that will ultimately lead towards the kinds of outcomes we're trying to accomplish. So in very simple terms, a lot of what Nedi is saying is right when they leave Israel and they take that post that survey, they might be in that unfrozen, uh, still figuring things out state. Um, and uh, I think we feel very, as a funder, certainly we feel very, um, very good about the theory of change, that the best way to have lasting impact is to provide that unmediated experience um, and not try and tell or teach but but let them experience and we trust that in the long run and as the longitudinal data that we haven't talked about on this call shows that a <laughs> lot of these uh, positive effects stick and there are some measures where it does show that you know no change or decline immediately but then it kicks in a year later after they've gone home lived again on college campus, they're able to kind of piece it together. And then a year later, those numbers then bounce back up. Thank you. Another question, and I think this goes to what Alon was talking about, how seeing people in, in sandals at business meetings, um, but how might you create an immersive cultural and language experience via the remote internship? You now you, you touched on it a bit about how people can get that experience. Right, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I, I try to explain it, but I, I mean, first of all, I think I think it's you know difficult. I think that I mean clearly that is that's the place you know the 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 sights, the smells, the sounds, the feel. Um, you, you know, the, clearly we all understand that. So the question is, what can we do uh, to make progress in that regard, given the limitation? And I think here. Again, I think the educational program is definitely part of it. I gave the example of the Meet the Israelis program, which which does that. And we're trying to take more and more of the education in that direction. And there's more innovation also in distance learning today to try to not just have the talking head lecture, but actually try to capture, you know, that visceral level, whether it be a virtual tour of, uh, of a food market, um, whether it be, you know, um, getting to a site and, and seeing different viewpoints on the issues that are happening there. Um, th there's that type of approach through the distance learning to do that. Um, there is, and then as uh, the other part I stress was the the role of the Israelis who are interacting with the participants. And again, here we have two, or, or at least two. We, we uh, I would say three. We have the mentor him, him or herself, um, and them understanding their role as cultural immersers is critical. And that's something we kind of didn't see as strongly the first round through, but we're doing more of that now. Uh, and that also is giving them tools. Um, you know, they actually, in a, in a uh, review session with the employers, they said, well, it'd be great for us to know what is the educational program they're going through, because then we can kind of refer to it. So let us know what they had on Monday on the Zoom um, session. And then when we have the meeting with them on Tuesday, we can actually ask them, well, what did you think about the issue of the ultra-Orthodox in Jerusalem? I know you saw it. So that kind of connection between disparate parts of the program, that's something we can do more to create. Um, there's the co-workers and, uh, you know, here obviously time difference is an issue, but we try to create within the weekly work schedule places where people are part of team meetings. Um, you know, different companies have different cultures, but, uh, and, and again, if the team itself is virtual, then you're joining a virtual team and everyone is in the same place and you're going to pick up hopefully some of that Israeli culture through that interaction. Um, and then there is the Israeli uh, internship coordinator, who has a very important role in the remote program, uh, not just of finding the internship, but of working with the person on a weekly basis. And this is a person really who is trying to, you know, give the cultural singles, unpack the experience, let people know how they can fit in better, um, and and help them understand what they're going through. So. Again, I don't think it's the same, and I think this is the place where if you would ask that question, I think you you would see the difference, but there are things that we can work on and we're trying to do so in, in terms of cultural immersion. Okay, in our last few few moments that we have together, I actually have a question and, I also, and I'll keep uh, the Q&A box open and the chat box open if anybody still has a, a last question or two. So my question is pretty open-ended, but I wanted to, uh, to see and go through with each of you is there anything that was surprising about your experience or the data uh, from this past that came out from the data or from the experience that that you would like to share? Surprising or a good lesson learned that you want to continue on? We can start with whoever wants to start. 
maybe Josh, if there's something that you wanted to, to share. Yeah, I, I mean, I like we're still I really need to go back, I, I need to look at those slides thoroughly. And like I said before, what I'm really interested in is comparing the uh, initial satisfaction, you know, net promoter score type data with the outcome data and looking at them side by side and seeing where they differ and trying to understand that. I, I think uh, because, um, you know, there's so many business decisions, I, I'm we we as a funder are super excited at the possibilities of new kinds of programs that I alluded to before, you know, a, um, you know, four weeks in person over winter break, followed by eight weeks remote, you know, for someone who can't give up their summer, but could give up that time period or someone who wants to try kibbutz living while remote working for a startup in Tel Aviv. Um, from a business perspective, there's so much promise, but we need to make sure that we're really have that we really have our eye on the outcomes, and we don't just offer uh, uh, products that participants want, but that don't result in the fundamentally have the impact that those who are um, writing the checks uh, want to have. Um, that's my answer. Thank you. So I'll, I'll pick up from Josh and actually say, I mean, kind of the flip side of that, what we're dealing a lot with is um the way in which both the participants and the companies are adjusting to the idea of remote um and 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 my biggest worry right now in terms of the gap that we we have is that from a business model point of view for all the reasons Josh said this is a brilliant idea um but from the point of view of do will participants choose to do it uh, and will companies be able to work want remote interns those are two big questions which we don't have any empirical data. I mean, we have some impressions for it, but we have to try it. We have to see. And it, a lot depends on the conditions. So we can believe in like in the brave new world of tomorrow's workplace, where if you have remote skills, you're going to be at the top of the pecking order. But that might not be true, first of all, who knows? And second, if you're a 20 year old, you might not see things that way and you probably don't. Um, and at some level, you know, we're asking people to sort of say, come to Israel for less time, but have a longer internship and there's new possibilities. We, we don't know and that that's a, there's a marketing issue there. There's a persuasion issue. There's a, 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 a paradigm question, which we're in the middle of forming. We might help form it. I mean, we could make a contribution to remote work and kind of, you know, we could be a pioneer in this, but we also could run into real obstacles as to we're not we're not there yet and you know covid was here covid's gone let's get back to normal we don't there's a lot of big questions here so that's something we're thinking a lot about that uh, just from reflection of what we've done so far and where we are now and it's great to hear just the questions that you're asking yourselves and and thinking forward looking back seeing the data and trying to make those best decisions and trying to make the different plans so you yeah. still create the impact that you're that that's that you're meant to make it to, to do and keep true to your mission. Um, great. And Nati, any any comments from any thoughts from you right now? Um, I was just gonna add to, to that last piece, Ilan. Um, I was wondering if you just wanted to share with the group um, some uh, so, some thoughts about the market research that you're um, you're setting out on to to look into like what really is the appetite for um for remote and for like different models of programs yeah no for sure so as we kind of go into this question one of the things we're doing is really doing focus groups amongst uh people who uh, uh who haven't signed up for onward and, and and some people who have and trying to understand from them or what how do they look at remote work it, it's it's uh, opportunity it's here to stay what attracts them? Um, what's the way to present it to make it most viable for them? What are they afraid of? You know, all those things to try to unpack that a bit, and that can really help us with the product design. So we're about to uh, work with our colleagues at Rossov in this kind of market um, market study, uh, which is it, it's tied is into the product design. We're doing that in February, March, I think, in terms of the groups um, uh, in, in North America. Uh, and it will really help us along with what we learned from people on the ground this summer to thinking about next year's iteration. Thank you. When you said February, I'm like, oh, and I'm like, wow, we're already in yeah, February, February and into March. Yeah. I'm sure we all have like those moments of like, wow, we're already almost in March again. All right. Well, I want to thank um, Ilan, Annette, and Josh so much for being um, for being here and sharing 
sharing your wisdom with us and for all the work that you're doing every day. Um, more importantly, really, thank you for all of that. And thank you everybody who participated in this program um, and continue to learn with us here at JFN. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to me. I can help connect you with the, with the presenters. And, and we look forward to continuing to learn together. And thank you all again. Have a great day and stay well.